introduction to search search is a membership based democratic socialist organization that links and enables socialist activists across political parties generations movements and geographies all around australia we have a diverse membership but we hold common values summarized in our goal of democratic ecological socialism we run socialist education programs we publish news and views on facebook and twitter and at search.org.au and we put on events like this one this event is the latest in a series which has included uh, adam bandt bernard Caleri, sharon burrow michelle o'neill um, just to name a few and i encourage you as i said to check out those previous events on our search foundation youtube channel i encourage you to like the search foundation search facebook page to keep up with our events and go to search.org.au if you are interested in applying for membership our contact details are on the website and our Facebook page if you would like to talk to me about an event, our education program, or any other matter. Now to introduce Alex Cassie. Alex is a political and community organiser for the AMWU WA. She's the former national convener of Young Labor Left. She's the founder of Search for Your Rights Community Campaign, which was against the proposed stop and search laws in WA. We're also very lucky to have her on the search committee and she has organized tonight's event. Uh, thanks for being with us, Alex. Uh, I'll hand over to you to tell us a bit more about Collie and also uh, to do the introductions for Steve and Sean when the time comes. Great, um, thank you, Luke. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge that I am calling from Wajap Noongar country um, and the Noongar nation stretches all the way down to the Southwest as well, which is where we're talking about. Um, I am calling from um, so called Perth, um, here with Steve, um, Steve McCartney, as you know, the State Secretary of the AMWWA, um, and Sean Emmett is calling from uh, Collie. Collie um, Sean is one of our invaluable workplace leaders in the Muja Power Plant. He is the lead delegate for the Monodelphus Contracting Group down there, who are an invaluable and permanent workforce in Muja Power Station, and he will speak more to you about what that means later on. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge, of course, um, there are other AMW comrades on here, so it's good to, um, good to see you on here. And um, I will, without much further ado, get started. Um, perhaps it's a good segue saying the other AMW colleagues on here, of course, um, are people who have been working on similar projects in other parts of Australia, um, particularly in the Hunter at the moment. Um, and I thought I'd start for the benefit of our interstate colleagues with a bit of an explanation as to um, where Collie is and what it is and why we're talking about it. If I can get my slides started, there we go. Um, so Collie just transition. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, Collie is a town of about 8,000 people in the southwest of Western Australia, about 40 minutes inland or up the hill from Bunbury. Um, and uh, coal was first discovered there by um, white Australians in 1883 and the town of Collie is there because of coal. Um, as you see from the early 20th century, it was producing, um, you know, 140,000 tonnes of coal in an open cut mine. Um, there's a brief timeline there. First coal-fired power station built in 1931. Mooja power station was built in 1966. Worsley Refinery built in the 80s to take advantage of the fact that there was um, a steady power source there. Um, the last underground mine closure in 1994, Collie Power Station opened in 1999, 2009 Blue Waters Power Station um, completed um, and Worsley now does cogeneration. You will note of course there that there are three power stations and two coal mines, um, Griffin Coal and Premier Coal. Um, and in 2017, Muja A and B units were retired, and then there has been the announcement of the stage retirement of Muja C. Um, so that's why we're talking about a transition here. This is this retirement plan is part of the government's whole of system plan. Um, I think it's important to note for our eastern states colleagues that we're on a different electricity grid over here. We're on the Swiss. Um, and so this is in response to the state government's regulation of the power system here, which WA state government can do um, because it wasn't privatised and it's entirely within our state borders. 
Um, so Collie now, population is 8,700. Um, that has been on the decline recently. And that is obviously one of the things that you know, adds urgency to the Just Transition project at the moment. 23% employed in mining, notably 50% of whom have worked in that industry for more than 10 years. Something else very important to consider in a transition. Um, as you see there, there's once you add on the um, people employed in mining and then the associated manufacturing and um, electricity, gas and waste services, you're looking at um, a fair chunk of the town. There is no export coal mine in um, the southwest of Western Australia. It is used for domestic power only, which again creates a different um, situation than the eastern states. Um, so why is this coming up now? Um, I mean, it, it seems like it's across the news everywhere these days when we talk about transition away from coal-fired power. Um, this is something that in WA um, is mapped out in the whole of system plan and the distributed energy resource roadmap. This is happening because of the economic um, change to renewable and um, as Steve was mentioning at the start, when some people come into the room, a mix of renewable and gas. Um, I think it would surprise a lot of people um, to know that actually one in three households in WA has a solar panel on its roof, and that's going to be about two in three by 2030. Um, we are hitting on some days over 50% of our electricity comes from renewables already. So there is a in, there is an economic um, change over that is happening here, and it, in some ways it's almost that the environmental imperative is you know, the economic outcomes. Um, so that's the kind of, uh, I guess, legislative context, um, which as a research officer is, is my job to be across. Um, the political context, um, and Steve and Sean will talk a lot more about this from their perspectives um, at the different ends of this. Um, we, know, we know over here, you know, when we talk about transition, sometimes that has a loaded meaning in the Eastern States. There is, um, you know, a fear of failure from having seen people promise big things before and not necessarily working out the way they'd hoped. We still use the term just transition here um, with the intention that we actually do make sure that that fulfills all of those commitments, but there is that concern there. It's a very high union, dens um, high union density town with a very proud history of powering the state of Western Australia. Um, we have a WA Labor government and um, it's a WA Labor seat. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, that is usually the way that um, coal mine towns go. Um, the coal companies are struggling economically, particularly Griffin. Um, they're in a huge amount of debt. Um, a fun anecdote is that the news agency won't even let them buy their newspapers on credit. Um, and there is a mix of government run and um, private operators. Um, and like I said before, there's a visible and rapid decline in the use of coal predominantly for the economic um, reasons. So enter the union movement. Um, and I will hand over to Steve and Sean to speak about the um, campaign that we've been running on this. Um, and I will just say, this might be something that, um, you know, we've been hearing a little, about, little bit about recently, but it's obviously something that's been on the mind for people in Collie for, I would say, a, a decade now. And I'll let Steve talk a little bit more about that context now. So without further ado, I hand over to Steve McCartney, the State Secretary. Uh, hi, thanks for the opportunity about talking about this, because I think uh, the more people that understand what we're trying to do here uh, and the way we're going about it and the more the more feedback we get around what we're doing, we're trying to learn from um, other people's mistakes and other people's uh, vision. But I can also say um, part of our motivation in Western Australia to get involved early with, uh, with the Collie stuff and the transition was the fact that some time ago, uh, the West Australian government did a, um, a transition from uh, wood harvesting in the Southwest, and they were gonna do a just transition and no one was gonna get left behind. Uh, the reality of it is it was a disaster. Uh, and about 10% of the people that were, that 10% uh, of the people got the work, uh, the other 90% of the people got left on the, on the beach. And what we wanted to make sure that if we go, while we're going through a transition in coal, uh, that we didn't have our members sitting on the beach wondering what was going on. And I think, uh, Collie thinks as a town, it's a solid, very solid community. Uh, it thinks as a town and um, 
what we were worried about is what we saw happening in the eastern states is when they started talking about transition all of a sudden a couple of things happened um there was pressures on pressure on wages especially for precarious workers because um they were able to there was more pressure so they could put more pressure on workers about taking any job for any cost um when governments start talking about transition the personal investments of our, our members in that in that town were getting affected as well so we talked to the state government and we also talked to synergy about creating an artificial uh, economy around uh, collie to ensure that wages and conditions didn't get dropped and there wasn't competition for wages and uh, conditions go and they didn't go through the floor and we tried to rectify uh, the state government making stupid comments um, we had a treasurer and he's left now but one of the treasurers uh, every time he made a comment on the media people's housing price, housing prices were going down by nine nine thousand dollars so we wanted them to shut up making stupid comments around uh, the longevity of coal and the transition and until they actually had a had something in place to talk about um, how we got to uh, where we are now is it started off um, with us talking to our members uh, around um, coal and the likelihood of coal being becoming um, a commodity that won't be getting used into the future and what that meant for them um, there was a fair bit of pushback to start with but when we had a conversation about it was about arms and legs per kilowatt hour um, people understood the economics of it so the next thing we had to think about was what are we going to do to make sure that people are going to get uh, not get left behind inside this arrangement and of course make sure a town doesn't get fitted up with something it doesn't want so um, I went to a, uh, the first ALP meeting that they had in Collie. Uh, there was about uh, 25 people attended it. I think about 20 of those people wanted to be politicians one day. Um, and um, uh, the, the member of parliament was late, 20 minutes late. We had the welcome to country. I think there was about three questions, a photo opportunity, and they left. Um, that inspired me to uh, talk to the other unions in the town, which is uh, predominantly the ASU uh, and the ETU um, and some members of the CFMU, uh, especially the CFMU Mining Division. And um, we had a discussion amongst ourselves about maybe calling all our members to a meeting so we could talk uh, unilaterally about where we are and how we can connect best with uh, the community. So we did do that. We talked to our members. We got um, about 40 or 50 uh, to a meeting, um, to our very first meeting to discuss it. Um, we asked them to go back and, and be advocates for this discussion to go further. And I won't bore you with the amount of meetings we did have, but we did have uh, three or four, but it accumulated in the end to about 250 people coming to a meeting from the town. Um, and I think the important part of that was the cross-section cross of the community. So it was small businesses were there, uh, mums and dads were there, people that weren't actually connected to the coal mine, but were very interested because of their own investments were sitting in that town. So we managed to have a um, discussion about that. Um, and we talked about where we could, what the opportunities could be, um, what the reality of shutting down uh, Polly was gonna look like. And we sort of put to the public, uh, to the community, what did they see? Where did they wanna see their town in the next 20, 30, 40 years. And, um, you know, there was uh, some resistance to go to move anything because things have worked so well for the last hundred odd years that why are we trying to interfere and, and make that happen? But ultimately, the debate started turning around to where are we going to go? What is our next step? And how do we make sure our young people don't leave the town? And um, that um, accumulated into us um, forming a committee. Um, and um, we did get um, every breed of politics there uh, at that meeting at one stage or another, um, because uh, at the time uh, the upper house uh, was, uh, had a colleague across benches that were making decisions on behalf of the upper house. So we wanted to make sure that they knew where our issue was and we got them to endorse it uh, in front of the crowd, in front of the uh, members that uh, that's what they're gonna do. So we wanted to lock in the smaller parties and then we got the ALP got locked into uh, coming to those meetings and having the discussion 
with the town. We thought the best way forward was to form a steering committee of, and, it's a, and it is a cross section of the people, uh, uh, of all the stakeholders. And we've been having regular meetings and working with government departments, uh, governments, local members, uh, local industry, the CME and the CCI um, to make sure that uh, we get a, a, an understanding about what it means, about how we can make a just transition um, just and how we can make sure we leave no one behind. Yeah, we've gone into the discussion around um, when we do have new energy and new 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 um, uh, commodities or industries moving into the town. And you know, we're saying quite clearly, if you're going to take an industry out of the town, you actually have to replace it with big industry. Um, small small business isn't going to save save the town. Um, so we're, uh, when that big business arrives, and we're you know, we've been campaigning as a union to make that new energy and energy storage um, because uh, of its traditional homeland of being a power generator for the state and the fact that it's um, the start of the Swiss, which is the uh, line that we all work, we all get powered under. Um, and when we, when we looked at those jobs, uh, we looked at how we could attract that. We had meetings with government. Uh, that committee had meetings with government. Government regularly come to those uh, meetings. We've got a Southwest Development Council, which is also uh, chairing those meetings, so that we've got all the players involved that can actually make decisions around where we need to be. Um, we've got pots of money out of the state government, and we're, we're talking federally as well to try and see where we can entice that federal money to try and help with this transition. And then, of course, we've gone down the road of trying to attract business. And um, we're at a point now. Um, where we've um, our members are in our members are, are talking about um, a just cam, uh, just transition. We've got a steering committee working through um, uh, working through uh, draft memorandums of understanding, so that industry, the the public, the shire council, the local government, and the unions all understand and all support the direction that we're heading in. Um, that stability, I think, is one of the reasons we, we can have got more chance of getting a, a successful outcome because we've, we haven't got any cross purposes. We've got, um, uh, we want to make sure that no one gets left behind. We want to make sure that um, people have got a just transition to the new work, a new work environment. We want to make sure that the contractors that have been contracted out in the 90s that should really be working for Muja Power Station. Um, to be recognised that way and treated the same way through a just transition um, as every other employer down there. Uh, we want to make sure that um, the local industries, especially the service industries that have been servicing the mine during this transition, while we've got um, new energy, hopefully, um, and battery construction, hopefully, and other industries moving into town, um, as that service expertise comes into town, we build joint ventures between those subcontractors so that we don't lose people in town, we actually gain people in town. And we can have a crossover of skills over that period of time through the transition so that um, uh, people can land with a job at the other end. And we also keep the uh, local economy humming. I think the advantages we've got as, as a group at, at the moment, and what's giving me some confidence as a union, confidence as a union leader, along with other union leaders in the area, is the fact that we are all getting around the table and, and talking and honest and just straight discussions about where we need to be. We are reminding the government and the companies uh, quite often that we want to make sure people aren't getting left behind. And that doesn't just mean our members in the power station or the coal mines. That means every worker in that town should have the right to be uh, respected and looked after the same way as uh, any other worker. So if we get a transitional uh, situation going where we get training, upskilling, whatever, that should be open to everyone in the town that wants to become part of the economy of the future. I think um, uh, without uh, uh, taking up too much more time, um, that's where we are politically. So we've got the uh, state government engaged. We've got the local government engaged. We've got the Chamber of Commerce and, Commerce and Industry playing a productive role. Uh, we've got the CME uh, interested 
and we've got the local members around that area, including the member that, that looks after Kemberton, which is another industrial site down the road, and um, also the member for Bunbury, engaged in this whole debate to make sure that when we uh, initiate and fulfil the transition we want to fulfil, it radiates from Bunbury to Collie and back. Uh, that's, that's our position, I'll leave it there. Thanks for the opportunity to talk. Great, thank you, Steve. Um, thanks for that outline. Um, we're gonna hand over to Sean Emmett now, who's, um, as I mentioned earlier, one of our workplace leaders and AMW delegate at Moosh Power Station. Um, Sean, uh, over to you. Hold on, Sean, you're muted. How's that? Can you hear me? That's perfect. All right. Okay. Thanks very much uh, for having me. Let me uh, have an opportunity to speak to you guys. Um, so I'll talk to you guys about what it's like from the point of view of contractors working for the power stations. Um, and basically the contractors who support the Muja power station, which is the, the biggest power provider in the state. Um, so our feeling is, and, and from what we see at the moment, is that we really aren't included in, in the conversation. Uh, definitely the unions are, are there for us and, and having the conversation, but from, from where we see it, uh, we are basically forgotten about. We, we had a conversation with Synergy, who runs the power station, uh, quite early in the piece. And, and one of the questions we asked them was, what is your obligation to your contractors? And they came back pretty straight away and said, there is no obligation to contractors. It's up to your companies to look after you in, in terms of just transition. So that's your upskilling, your training and all that. The problem is these companies will not spend a cent unless they think they can get two cents back so they're never going to provide us with anything that might cost them something if they don't think they can get a return so for us we are sort of in the wilderness a bit and this is where we need um i guess pressure from the government from transition groups to say you need to start paying attention to these guys because at that power station, say that 100% of the workforce that are there, 50% are, are contractors that, that feed into that mine or feed into that power station. And that's everybody from uh, you know, maintenance of the coal plant, which is like what we do, to cleaners, to scaffolders, to laggers, to sheet metal workers. They're all part of that group that make that power station work. And pretty much to a man, if you ask them, what involvement have you had in just transition they'll say nothing unless it was talking to you about it um so that's one of our our big worries um you know steve talks a lot about no one left behind and the feeling is that we definitely will be left behind uh unless we get some sort of uh promise if you want to call it that from synergy from government that there will be some sort of training involvement or, or anything at the moment because right at the moment we're seeing nothing there's been you you can't talk to your management about just transition they just shrug their shoulders and say oh that's not that's not us that's somebody else so we we feel a bit left out and um there is a lot of workers there and a lot of these guys have been at these power stations their entire working life uh they started out working for synergy or sequa or sec back it was then and just through privatisation, they've been put into contracts and what we've seen over all the years is the diminishing wages and conditions of contractors at those sites. So again, one of our biggest uh, goals and, and Steve's talked about it was to try and be brought back into, uh, into the power station to work for Synergy directly. And that's really the only way we believe we'll 
we'll get any involvement in transition because at the moment it's um it's nothing it's absolutely nothing so um yeah so for us it's 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 business as usual we turn up to work we we do our jobs uh we have to um we're going through a current eba negotiation um, because of the uncertainty and contracts and who's got it and whatever the the companies that we work for the contracting companies have weaponized that as a way to to say well you know we don't know what's going to happen how can we possibly you know pay you this uh, wage rise when we don't know if we'll have a job so they're using these um uncertain times as a way of uh, i guess stifling wage growth which um you know which is not good for anybody in this country um the other thing we we see a lot of which really boils the blood of a lot of these guys is um the excesses of uh synergy and and how they've taken this just transition and the the money or the 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 training or whatever they're getting and they are just spending it and uh they've got no problem telling us about the fantastic redundancies they're getting or what training opportunities they're going for um financial advice whatever they want it seems that the the checkbook is open well and truly for them but uh you know we, we struggle to get a pie warmer without explaining our um why we need it so we, we sort of got the um i was going to say something but uh we're not too happy with them at the moment um yeah it all seems one way at the moment um so for us as again as contractors um we need to keep the conversation going but we also need to put pressure on government on synergy to try and include us in this conversation i know the unions are doing that and they're literally the only ones who are doing it um we don't even get an invite to a meeting you know and uh, when we talk to a synergy management guy about what's happening with us they just go no that's your company they'll sort that out that's nothing to do with us so we want to see a little bit more involvement in that as for how things are going in town um what what our hopes are i mean you know we've got high hopes but really they're just hopes at the moment where um there's nothing concrete for us as we see it um like it really does keep coming back to we need to be brought back into synergy in-house and work directly for them rather than to these contracting companies which are, are labor hire companies they they hire you out they they collect the cream and that's it that's where their involvement stops you know they're not they're not uh, attached to it in any way um you know things in town are not too bad there's been a bit of a boom i suppose um house prices are going up uh you can't buy a house you can't rent a house uh which is which is good for the town but that's really come off the back of some money that was spent recently on um tourism and attracting more people to town and uh, a couple of the yeah tourism ventures that have happened um but i don't think it'll last for long we can't um like steve was saying we need to replace industry with industry and at the moment there's not a lot of big industry that we know of that's that's happening there might be a concrete plant they're doing a feasibility study on but um yeah so we'll see we're, we're hoping for the best um what else can i say about that um that's really it for me it's uh we got high hopes and, and we you know they know the union's doing really well we just need to work harder at pushing uh synergy and the government into um looking after the contractors looking after uh, so not just contractors but as steve said everybody affected by this there's, there's a lot of people whose livelihoods not just in collie but um in the whole of the southwest down to bunbury dialy up um Trino, all these places where these guys come up the hill to work they work here and then they go home and if if this falls over and there's not a good plan in place it's going to affect more than just collie it's going to infect or affect the southwest on, on a whole so um yeah like i say we're hoping for the best and we're going to work for it 
but we'll we'll see how we get on. Um, that's all I got. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sean, for that. Uh, um, I think you've really outlined there some of the challenges of actually implementing this right now. Um, I guess just to kind of um, wrap up what Steve and Sean were saying. I mean, the Just Transition Working Group that has evolved out of that steering steering committee has created a plan now that has, um, you know, the four priorities of um, celebrating college history, ensuring a commitment to the just transition, economic diversification, and then um, ensuring that any impacted workers are um, looked after. And it's a great plan. And um, the working group is really productive and collaborative in putting together that plan. But now is the kind of um, I think uh, there's someone on this call from the community who who refers to this as the um, as the premiership quarter that we're in now. We need to make sure that things get done to set us up for success in the future. And um, that's about the economic diversification piece and making sure that contractors are incorporated. Um, the synergy MOU that Sean was referring to, I, I perhaps should have introduced at the start, is a MOU between synergy and the unions of direct employees. And that is around individualised transition plans um, for all of the affected synergy workers. So it is, it is a just transition planning document, but it, it is frustrating that people who are doing the same work and have been in the same workplace for um, years are not incorporated in that. And that is something that is um, our priority in the campaign for the just transition going forward. Um, I really want to thank John for that as well. Um, it's so important to have people like yourself who are taking this up in the workplaces where um, we can't hear what the bosses are saying to us all the time, but you're there. So thank you for that. Um, I think now, Luke, on the running sheet, it's um, open for questions and discussion. So I'm not sure if people have got questions for Sean or Steve. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions already coming through. So, and everyone else, please feel free to uh, Put them in the chat. I've also made the chat now open to everybody. Uh, any comments, any questions you like, um, and you can send direct messages to other comrades and you know directly that you haven't seen for a while uh, and things like that. And there's a few comments there. Hopefully, people can see those from Luke Skinner, Hannah Smith, and Felicity Wade thanking you for your your talk. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Leonie Scoffin sent through some earlier, and I noticed Leonie's uh, email. Um, um, uh, internet connection isn't brilliant, but uh, she has sent through some questions which I might read, but I might try to give her the call um, if that's possible so she can ask it herself um, if her, her MBN connection um, or her internet connection is good. I'm enough. here. Can you... Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Pedal fast, Eliane. Hi, Eliane. Hi, how are you all? I need to find my glasses. Hang on. Sean's actually, and sorry, my dog's barking and I can't stop her. Um, better find it now. I emailed it through. Um, well, I can, well, I can ask it on your behalf if you like, yeah, I don't mind. I'll still let the dog I'll out. Like okay. <laughs> now, I'll, I'll ask it on Leonie's right. behalf, says uh, she did work and send it through. So, um, how are the contractors that work in the coal and energy sector going to be supported? and or remunerated as the units close down over the next few years at Moja. As she said, I believe Synergy has a plan for their direct employees, but there are many coal local uh, and driving workers that are contractors and do not fit under the umbrella of a permanent employee. Uh, on page 18 and 19 of the WA Government Just Transition Plan, there is mention of what Synergy plan to help their employees, but I see no mention of their contractors. Um, how does Sean feel about being a contractor at Muja and does he feel he's treated equally to the direct Synergy employees uh, which who have been offered, uh, has been treated the same as they uh, have been and been offered the same as they have been by the company? So that's the first question, Pat. I think you were saying, Leonie, did you want to add anything Not to really. that? Not really. I mean, Sean's already um, answered that um, and I already know Sean's answer because Sean and I and my husband and you know, we're family friends, so I just wanted that to be discussed in an open forum so everyone else knows what Sean and his um, comrades are going through. So Sean's already really answered that. Um, so I'm quite happy with that, not unless you want to add anything else to that, Sean or Steve. Uh, I, I would like to add a little bit to it. 
because um, I think it was part of the discussion we had just uh, recently at the last meeting was about um, one we made, we put it on we put it out that uh, the people that are uh, close and were the, the ex permanent people for Muja, uh, where Sh Sean fits in that in that category that you so aptly described earlier, should be taken on board and getting treated the same way. And we're producing a letter uh, to go directly to the Synergy and the government uh, explaining that in full where we think that should be. But the other discussion, there's four working groups come off the back of uh, yesterday's discussion. And part of that is making sure that. Uh, that people don't get left behind and there is a transition for contractors. And what we said, our position quite clearly is that if we're in a position where we've got precarious workers that need upskilling or whatever, and we haven't got a uh, subcontractor that's got the ability to pay, then part of the just transition should be that they get the training that everyone else is and that only make it just. And if the government has to pay that, then that's part of the transition cost in our view. Mm. No. So, how, 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 sorry, how are you going to achieve that then, Steve? Are you going to be um, lobbying the government to, to do that? Because it well, looks like, from what Sean says, that monos have got no interest whatsoever in um, helping the workers. Oh, I, don't, I didn't imagine, with my wildest dreams, that any of the contractors would actually care about their workers. Mm -hmm. All they really care about is the profit off the back of their workers. Um, and, you know, Synergy is uh, going to make noises about, oh, well, we'll give them a big parcel of money so they can get a good redundancy and, and whatever too. But I don't trust that either because usually any extra money that goes into a contract that goes straight into their pockets, it doesn't go into training for workers. And what we're clearly seeing is that the benchmark for training and, the, and uh, for upskilling uh, inside this transition was really discussed and, and met inside uh, the Synergy Agreement. And we're saying that everyone should be able to follow that same process. And if uh, the particular industry or they are a big employee or they are a casual employee uh, that haven't got permanent work should get the same opportunity to get the upskilling they need and the career path they want to make sure they can stay in the town and be part of the economy. That's, mm -hmm. that's quite clear from our perspective. And I've got to say, I don't, I don't think there's a lot of argument about that around the table. I think the argument will come when we're talking directly to the minister about the money he has to spend. And, you know, the best part about this discussion is that minister can answer the town as well as the committee. Yeah. Thank you for that. I did, um, there's a couple of questions coming through. One there from Steve Murphy and from Hannah Smith, which we'll get to. At, uh, I had a question from Danielle uh, Martin, who is a CPSU and TSU member uh, zooming in from uh, Ipswich, she asked, well, I think there's a question a lot of people would be interested in, is how do you set up an artificial economy? What replacement economies are you looking at for the town and what were the tourism ventures that created this, this at least short-term boom? What, well, yeah, what are the alternatives? Our, fir our first move our first move was with the, with the major employer and that was with Muja and uh, the, the contractors inside of Muja. So what we did is we set, because what we were concerned about um, a race to the bottom of waves and conditions while everyone was panicking about work and their, and their housing loans and their, their own personal money. So what we've done, we've uh, ensured there's a rate uh, so that rate wouldn't go down any further and it was based on the uh, one of the uh, contractor's rates was outside of, it was a, a transfer whirly Parsons rate. Uh, we grabbed that rate. Uh, now there's been some uh, modifications in the minds of some of the uh, contractors about how they administer that rate and we've had our fair share of discussions with them around that because contractors will always be contractors um, but what we did what we did get from synergy and government was a guarantee that they would support that that rate and what that means is as we go down the scale and and we've seen this happen in other places of course as more pressure goes on jobs in the town that gives labor hire companies and other uh, um, companies like Monodolphus with no conscience at all, uh, they will just sit there and try and screw workers down to nothing to make sure that their profit margin stays the same. What we've done is eliminate that by getting a rate inside the Muja so it can't fall down that low, which supports the contractors around Muja. Um, they're going through an EBA now, and the irony of that is there's no discussion from Muja about a parcel of money to help anyone with anything to do with uh, transition. And uh, that's interesting considering 
that we're already having those discussions around the table um, about how we can go forward. And I think um, uh, Monodolphus um, is going to be uh, one of the uh, people that get mentioned, or they are one of the contractors that get mentioned in our letter back to Synergy around the respect that those workers should be treated by. I think the respect doesn't stop at the workers that have always been um, traditionally working in Muja before they got contracted out in the 90s. Um, we also have to think about the people in town that just work the shutdowns and work through those spaces and other precarious workers to ensure that they can get the training and upskilling they need to do exactly the, the same stuff, but with the new industries as they appear. And, and one of the other things was, and we've just had a battle in Kempton right now about employing local. So um, that's, that's the other discussion that we've been having that they should be maximizing uh, local employees. Um, and of course, um, Monodolphus and um, others, we're talking about importing uh, workers from the Eastern States to go and do that work at Kemberton in the direct indirect um indirect uh contrary to what they what they promised everybody so we got into the media we got into the government and that got turned around in 24 hours um the most important thing we really want to focus on the new industries and uh, and the game plan for them when they move into town so to make sure that they've got a script and a structure when they come to town they know that they've got to pick up local people that they've got to help in the upskilling because if they want to invest in the town they've got to invest in the whole town Thank you for that. Um, it's a great question from Steve Murphy, who happens to be the National Secretary of the ANW. <laughs> That's pretty good. You front me with the boss, eh? <laughs> good, you, Steve. No, it's a really good question. What were the most important and most difficult conversations to get to where you are? Um, to try and con enough money out of my National Secretary to get this done. <laughs> Which, by the way, I haven't got one cent. I just thought I'd put that in. Um, and uh, I think... Uh, the most important thing, first step was talking to our members about what was going on. And that was the members that are working in the coal industry um, about where, where our vision, where we thought coal was going to go, what we thought about renewable industries in the future and, um, and where we think they could land in town. Um, we've got a, um, uh, an opportunity through lithium uh, and all the bits of batteries uh, we can make in, in Western Australia. It's about educating the government as well of what our needs are and getting the government to make sure that they put the right pots of money in the right spot and making a bolder statement, making bold statements around what they want to have in this town. So we're saying at the moment, uh, the problem with uh, the transition at the moment is the government's not stating where they're going to go. And uh, what we're saying is if you don't hurry up and come up with some support about where this town's going to go, the town's going to tell you where they want to go and that's going to put them in a position where they don't want to be. So we want to put as much pressure on them. I think first step for us, the important thing, first step was talk to the members. The second important step was talk to the town. And the third thing was take the town's position and our position to the government. So that's how we did it. I don't know if I've got to tick off my boss or not. I might not, have, I might not be on the next call now. <laughs> Did you have anything to, to add to that, Sean? Uh, that was a question for, for both of you. So what was the you know most important and difficult conversations to get to where you are now with this plan? Uh, well, um, difficult, important conversations, we, we have them all the time. Um, like I say, it's, it's, it's very hard for us to, to actually, you know, I say from my point of view, from a contractor, to have a conversation directly with... Um, a synergy management or a just transition crew, we only can talk to, um, say, the union, and the union then speaks for us at these meetings. Um, Steve's right about what he was saying about, um, you know, things like lithium battery building and stuff like that. In a town like Collie, you'll always find enough people willing to do those jobs. We've got all the skills in the world here to build, manufacture, do anything we want. We just need to, like say, get the government to say, you're doing this, this is the money, get on with it. And, and they'll get it done in this town. I mean, there's no shortage of tradesmen here. And um, another good thing about Collie is when you say to someone, you want to build a refinery or a smelter or a battery manufacturing center, 
pretty much everywhere else says, no, not in my backyard. But in Collie, they say, no worries, we've got just the place for it. It's just over there. Come, you know, let us do it. Um, so, yeah, that's the sort of thing we like to do. Collie's an industry town that wants to stay that way. Exactly, yeah. Always has been. And um, I know that the tourism thing's been great, um, but it is it is an industrial town. It, it always has been. And, and you know, you talk to all the young fellas in town, you know, I've got young young. Uh, blokes, they're all they're all mad for trades. They all want to be the next machinist. They all want to be the next diesel mechanic, the the boiler maker. So that's I guess, and that's they've seen what their parents do. They want to do what their parents do, and that's how it is. I I, I just want to um, say that uh, I think some of the stuff that they did around the artwork and stuff in town, and the stuff on Wellington Bridge was um, a, a good step forward to make sure there was still some money coming into that economy while this was going on. Yeah. And uh, I think that's been a success and uh, I'm not I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying it's not the answer. No, no, you're right. I mean, people love it. There was a lot of people who were anti what they were doing and once it was done and, and we see it every Saturday morning, Sunday in town, there's that many tourists in town, it's definitely generating something. So... Yeah. It's, it'll see us, it'll tide us over maybe for a while. Yeah. But um, hopefully we'll we get some industry soon. Yeah. And uh, thanks to, to Kathy Miller, who just sent through a, a bit about the, um, the reference to that, the, the mountain biking trails, the camping, the bushland hiking, the, the um, Wellington Dam mural, uh, biggest mural in the world by far, apparently. Yeah. So I know. I'm not too far from Lithgow and um, people like going to, you know, saying industrial stuff. It's part of our human history. And uh, as you mentioned, a lot of people have got um, forebears who work in those places or, you know, directly uh, parents or whatever who appreciate what uh, they mean. Uh, I had a good question as well from Hannah Smith about how do you keep the spirits of members up um, over such a long fight, you know, like such a long process. It's not just an EBA. It's not just, uh, you know, a, a simple campaign or even the, a short-term thing it's a it's a very long term uh plan and uh, campaign how do you keep people involved and keep people involved? um well uh we we try well it's a difficult task and it's over a long period of time but i think uh we've got a we've we've lucked out as far as getting a town that actually is used to fighting and working together and uh they're a coal mining town, they're a tough town, and they've been uh, fighting most of their uh, existence in one way or another. This is just another fight where they've all got to get together. And um, uh, it's a, it's a, I suppose it's a lot like a lot of um, closely knitted towns. Um, uh, anyone can, they can all say things about each other, but you can't say nothing about the town if you don't live there. And uh, I think um, we've got a, a real diverse uh, group looking at a uh, projected view for the future for Collie. And I can tell you that uh, um, everyone around the table is talking about big industry coming to Collie, talking about making it work and talking about making sure we get the education. Like I can give you an idea, the people, the educators in this space are dying to find out what is the new industry so they can start getting these courses up and running. So it's about making sure we can pick winners get those winners to come to town and then get them to invest. Yeah, yeah I say um, when it comes to uh, people's spirits too, I, I've noticed at my workplace, um, there is a lot of dispirited men out there at the moment. They, I mean, they're used to a fight, but like I say, we've, we've been through it enough times. But at the moment, there are a lot of lips on the ground. And um, I guess it's uh, a hope is one of the things we all hope something's going to happen. And this is why we need to start seeing just small things that give us that continual little bit of hope that we can keep going because the talk of everybody at my joint at the moment is, well, you know, we could always go up north. And I've got to say to guys, that's probably not the answer, but I think that too myself a lot of the time, you know. Um, but we want to have a town, you know. There's, there's um, generations of families here. And if you start heading up to Perth to get on the plane, next thing you might as well move to Perth and stay there and the town yeah. dies. You know? yeah. That's what we don't I, want. Uh, and, and I think, it, I think uh, in the future, there was a big discussion just recently about uh, the, 
the way we're communicating with everybody. Uh, we're looking at different ways to make sure we can that, keep that communication stronger and more often and um, a bit more uh, uh, elastic so people can actually have their view and, and, and comment uh, quite openly about where we are. And also some of the services that are going to be provided are going to start more promoting themselves more inside of town. I'll just hand you over to Alex who probably had a bit help with that answer. Um, yeah, I just noticed your question there, Leonie. I think it's a really pertinent issue um, going on from what Sean was saying as well. I mean, it's something we discussed. If, if the only source of information people are getting about the Just Transition Working Group is from their union, that's great. And obviously, you know, that's really important. But we need to make it clear that the, the good conversations we have in that working group are real and it's not just us making this stuff up. Um, I will tell you, Leonie, that it is a very um, pertinent and relevant discussion that came up again in the working group yesterday because um, it's a repeated issue, this question of communication. And I think in some ways it becomes a proxy conversation for a larger question around the different levels of commitment of the people in that working group because we want to go and talk to people about everything that's going on. And then if there are um, some... Uh, parties who are going, oh, we're uncertain about what we can say, it raises the question about why they don't necessarily want to say what they're aiming for. Um, so I think that the communication question is one that um, uh, is really important. Um, and our perspective as, as the AMW on the working group, and I think that the other unions are similar on that, we, are, we have much more of a, if we had our way, everyone would be invited and we could have a back and forth the whole time. Obviously, because of the industry diversification piece and some of the other aspects, there's commercial and confidence issues um, raised there. But um, we, we think that it's it's good to actually go out and say what you want to do and be held accountable for it. And um, and I think that that conversation around the communications aspect is really important. And the government is now putting together an actual um, communication strategy on it. Um, to coordinate the colleague delivery unit that's been established will coordinate a kind of standard comms so that there is no excuse for the people who don't have their own comms offices and employers and that who might not have local comms people so that they can put that material out as well. Um, because we need to make sure that um, everyone has everyone has expectations on this and that we can hold people to account about those commitments that they've been made. So I think it's a really pertinent question. It is. Thank you for that, <clears throat> Leone. And we are getting almost to the end of the uh, meeting. Uh, I've noticed there are a really good comment from Kathy Miller, who's uh, said that there are a number of industrial proposals in the pipeline, um, not as big as coal yet, but all promising from Collie Creek. Um, Collagen extraction from sheepskins, uh, re-energy, re re-energy, waste to energy, bio oil, and canaponics, a massive proposal for medicinal cannabis growing and pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical production. Uh, and as a um, father of a, a child who uses that stuff, I can tell you for 300 bucks for a 25 mil bottle, um, that is a big profit uh, winner and we're not making it in Australia. So I hope to see it being made in WA. I'd rather pay... Uh, good union members here than have to pay um, uh, foreign producers for that stuff. So uh, it's 7.56. So I want to give the last final word to uh, Sean, Steve and Alex. Um, perhaps in the reverse order again, I'll go hand it to uh, Steve and finish okay. up. Um, by no means uh, is this uh, uh, done and um, uh, dusted and no way have we got all the answers but what we have got is a process we think we can find those answers in um, and a communication system um, and, and a rapidly improving one to make sure that uh, our members, uh, but more importantly, everyone in town gets to understand where we are, what's, what's uh, gonna get delivered and, um, and, how it's gonna, and how many jobs that's gonna create. Because all this has to translate into jobs. All this has to make sure that no one gets left behind and we have to make sure that uh, we get the skilling and the training and the apprenticeships we need to keep the young people in the town. That's our position. Brilliant. And any further add to that, Sean? Uh, well, yeah, like, like Steve said, it's a long way from uh, done. The fight's not over at all. Um, but like I say, our, our biggest fight's 
you know, from our point of view, we'll be definitely trying to uh, get re-enhoused with Synergy. Um, try and get rid of these contractors because they are parasites on the industry. Um, they provide nothing. They take as much as they can. It would be a massive mistake for anybody to give a company like a Monos a chunk of money and say, here, this is for your workers. Because by the time it gets down to us, there won't be much left. It's what they specialise in is is bleeding it off. So, um, yeah, uh, we'll we'll keep it going. We'll see how what we can do. But there, yeah, we're a long way from done. So, uh, yeah, thanks for listening. No worries. And finish up with you, Alex? Um, not too much to add. I just want to thank um, Sean and all of our workplace leaders um, for all the work that they do. I mean, for, for, for me... I'm a I'm a drive in drive out organizer and um, and I know that and it's it's the members who are dealing with this every day and fighting it every day and it, and it's them who will make this a success and I am hopeful that it can be a success I think if we're going to do a proper just transition anywhere we can do it in Collie um, but it's going to take a heck of a lot of work between now and then and um, I'm glad that we've got good members down there to do it. Thank you very much. More, I think everyone on this uh, call and people who get to watch this on uh, hopefully on our YouTube channel tomorrow or uh, in coming weeks will uh, wish you more strength to your arms. Um, as you say, if we can't um, uh, get a just transition, uh, if we're going to get it anywhere, we hope we get it in places like Collie and indeed in the Hunter. And it's very nice to have on the call uh, the founders of the Hunter Jobs Alliance who are trying to do a similar thing uh, for uh, hunter workers as we um, transition away uh, from coal in that uh, area as well. So I want to thank uh, Sean Emmett, Steve McCartney, and especially Alex Cassie for putting this all together. And thank you to all of you who came out for tonight's uh, meeting. And uh, we will see you at our, keep an eye on the uh, Search Facebook page and Search Foundation website. Uh, and your emails and your text messages and all the stuff that I send to people um, for our next meeting. Uh, and as I said, if you haven't, um, if you're interested in becoming a member of the Search Foundation, go to search.org.au. Uh, and if you're interested in putting on any events or or uh, having more of this conversation going, just get in contact with me. I'm not hard to find them on the Search uh, website and on the Search uh, Facebook and other places. So thanks all of you so much. We'll wrap it up there. And uh, good luck with the Collie Transition Plan. Thank you.